Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's an honor to have Richard Katz on the podcast. Dr. Katz received his PhD from Harvard University and taught there for 20 years. The author of several books, he has spent time over the past 50 years living and working with indigenous peoples in Africa, India, the Pacific, and the Americas. He is Professor Emeritus at the First Nations University of Canada and an adjunct professor of psychology at the University of Saskatchewan. <laughs> oh my God, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> he lives in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Okay, now tell me how to pronounce it. <laughs> Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, and it means uh, gently flowing river. <laughs> well, look, you're going to teach me and our listeners a lot today about indigenous populations and lots of nuggets just like that, you know, how to properly pronounce lots of things. Because as I'm reading your book, I come across a lot of things. I noted to myself, there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> so, Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point, eh, Scott, because part of what I've discovered in the various years that I've worked in indigenous cultures, it's very helpful to make the effort, eh? just as you are, to pronounce the word. And people are very generous in terms of mispronunciations if you try. It's when you assume that the word is not worth even learning that they kind of feel, hey, what's this guy? You know, if he hasn't, if he can't respect the fact that we have certain words, why talk to him? So it's good that you try. And when you make mistakes, I've made mistakes in different parts of the world. People have fun laughing at your mistakes. It's part of the idea of how to work with people who are different from ourselves. That's the key. Yeah. I love that. And that it's very clear that that theme runs through your whole book, yeah. that general spirit. Now, let's go all the way back. Let's go more than 50 years back in time for a second to even, you know, we're going to get to your Harvard years because they're fascinating and the people that you ran into. And I mean, it's a legendary story, you know. But before that, you know, what really got you interested in this topic? Like when you were in high school, for instance, did you have like a disposition toward acceptance and sort of understanding people who are different than you? Well, this is a fascinating question. See, the book started out, Scott, was going to start with the years even before high school. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I decided, well, I got to cut something out. So I cut out that material. But it's a very important question because how do we start to connect to a world that's so different from the one that we were raised in? Eh? Yeah. And for me, as I look back, when I was a little guy, you know, I, I can't say how old, but when I was a little guy, I experienced what I think a lot of young kids experience, which is flying. <laughs> and I used to fly around the house and going through the doorways and banking my arms and so forth. I think a lot of kids have that experience, but they don't talk about it. And I, of course, didn't talk about it because who was I going to talk to about it? Right. So that was something that I can't say that I built on that experience. But when I look back on it, I realized that that was part of what it meant for me in growing up. And then the other part, eh, Scott, was I always felt a little bit on the outside or maybe even a lot of on the outside. And having that experience of being on the outside, you look at things and you see the limitations of the world that you're living in. Now, as a four and five and six and seven year old and so forth, and it's not very sophisticated, but it's a notion that there is another way of being. Hmm? And, you know, Scott, that's the key, another way of being. Now, see, we're talking and, and your people will not realize, but I'm looking into your apartment. Now, your apartment is so different from mine. It's a very good way of living and so is mine. But I see and you can see you know, if you were here, that we're in different worlds. And the whole point of knowing that there are different ways of being is so important, but only known through experience. 
See, when I first went to the Kalahari in 1968, I had never been to another part of the world in the same way. And when I went there in 1968 to the Kalahari and saw the healing dance, Scott, I tell you, I had never seen anything like that before. As you know from the book, I had experience with psychedelics. It's Leary and Alpert. That's part of my own training. But it was different. And the difference was we weren't taking drugs in the Kalahari. People were just experiencing through the healing dance a different world. And I used to think that, gee, maybe it wasn't fair that I had that psychedelic experience before I went there because was it coloring what I was looking for? Right. And I realized, no, it wasn't coloring what I was seeing. It allowed me to see what was happening. That's the difference. You know, again, I said, was I kind of prejudging things? Oh, it's all psychedelic, all that kind of stuff. No, my psychedelic experience allowed me to see that what was happening with changes in consciousness and spirituality was real. And so it was a gift. The psychedelics was a gift, even though I didn't pursue that as a life's work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's go back to 1968. Were you at Harvard during that period? Yeah. See, I got my doctorate in 65, and that's when I had worked. I had worked with Erickson, and I'd worked with Murray, and and to some extent with Skinner was around in that time. And that was a revolution, the Skinner stuff. And, you know, we were talking, you and I, about Maslow. Maslow was also very fascinated in his early years with behaviorism. So in 1965, I got my degree. And in 1966 or so, or 67, I was doing a postdoc. And this guy, Richard Lee, was a friend of mine, walked up to me in the hallway literally and said, you know, I interested, you're interested in the psychedelic stuff, these states of consciousness. Would you be interested in working with us with a group of people that do this without drugs? You can imagine how exciting yeah. that possibility was. And then it turned out that there was some a need. You see, we have to be very clear that we're not going to a place to satisfy our excitement, to wet our, our enthusiasm. There has to be a reason why you go to these other places. And it turned out that Bushman people or Juntwa people were being overrun by other forces of capitalism and trying to kind of take away their lands. So my going there and talking about their healing dance enables them to speak with power the people who were trying to see them as primitive. See, in the 60s, that's where it was. Indigenous people are primitive. Can you define indigenous? Well, to me, yeah, it's a very important term because indigenous can mean, like, for example, palm trees would be indigenous to, let's say, warm climates. Mm -hmm. Indigenous to me means the first people to settle in their various parts of the world. Okay. Not, see, for example... Western psychology is indigenous to North America. Mm. That's not how I'm using the term. It's the first people to settle in different parts of the world. And all over the world, there are indigenous people. All over. Like, for example, in India, we think of that in the hills in India, there are indigenous people. We hardly hear about them. In Japan, there are indigenous people, particularly up north. So all over the world, there are people who settled the land and the first settlers of the land. Yeah. Thank you for defining that. So were you a, a postdoc at Harvard as well? I also did a postdoc, okay. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, your connection to Abraham Maslow is very, very interesting. You know, you came back from this, visiting that community and the healing dance, and you showed him a video, or you showed him slides, sorry, this was the 60s, so you showed him slides of the healing dance. And what was his reaction? Yeah, it's a very wonderful thing. We'll talk a little bit about Abe, right, Maslow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would so, be good. Um, he used to have, uh, Abe used to have these like soirees, intellectual soirees. And the one that I wanted to talk about, where which I do talk about in the book, uh, Stan Groff was there as well. Stan had just come over and was working wow. down in Spring Grove. And Stan made a little presentation of his work. And then I started to make a presentation of some of the things I had discovered and uh, found in the Kalahari. And the healing dance and the healing dance 
which is uh, described in the book, is a very powerful but also intensely physical experience. And many parts of the world, the spiritual trips or the spiritual journeys are physical. There's fasting, there's sweating, there's working hard and so forth. And among the Kalahari Shantwasi, there's very, it's a hard, hard dancing, you know, hard breathing and sweating. And it's, it's hard work. And I remember Abe, you know, he was kind of impressed. But the first comment he made is, gee, they sweat a lot. <laughs> and by that he meant it was a lower form. For Abe, it was a lower form of consciousness transformation than he was used to and he was writing about. It was very significant to me that that was his response. It was not dismissive, but it was placing that particular indigenous way at a lower level. And you know, in his hierarchy of needs, at the bottom are needs like survival needs, you know, food, shelter, and so on. Yeah. That's where many indigenous people start in their journey to the spiritual things. If you're fasting, <laughs> you're thinking about survival needs, you're yeah. hungry, you're tired. And oftentimes that's just the time. The sweat lodge is the same thing. You're hot, you're sweating. It's like demanding physically. And that's what releases the spiritual because from an indigenous point, it's all connected. For Abe, you had to go through the physical to get to the real stuff. And from an indigenous point of view, the physical is as real as the mental and the spiritual. Abe never understood that, yeah. Well, he did in the latter part of his life. You know, his revision that many people weren't aware of by putting transcendence at the top of his hierarchy, you know, it, it's kind of returned to ex the experiential aspect of yeah. human nature. He was very much into that. Peak experiences are very... Yeah experiential and he spent time and we, we really should should mention this because i know some indigenous populations are not so happy that he didn't talk more about his own experience visiting the blackfeet nation is that correct yeah blackfoot yeah. nation it's, yeah. it's the blackfeet peoples i guess yeah 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 so in the 30s and he spent some time there he was very interested in anthropology and he looked up to margaret mead and uh benedict ruth benedict you know right. uh, yeah. very much very much so yeah. So he had some influence there. And I was wondering, how much do you think that influence, you know, came back around again, so to speak, in the last couple of years of the life, once he got more into Eastern philosophy and Buddhism and Taoism, things like that? Yeah. yeah. Let me just say, in the book, I write quite a bit about Abe. And I think I mentioned, in, incidentally, to all the people who are listening, when you pick up a book, always read the footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of footnotes, by the way. Every page you have a footnote. You have four footnotes. footnotes is the personal things that you really care about, but you're not sure a lot of people yeah. will care about, but yeah. you care about. I find your footnotes very juicy. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. so I'm going to recommend to people. Yeah. So the thing is that with Abe is that he had a great disadvantage. He grew up in an urban environment, disconnected from land. And one of the things about indigenous peoples is it's a land-based spirituality. Nature is the teacher. So Abe had kind of like already a kind of uh, a block. And then during the times that he went, he went to the Sixessa Nation. Indigenous people were looked upon, even by people like Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, as somewhat primitive. Hmm. Others, very primitive. So Abe kind of like, he took a risk to go there, but very influenced by Benedict, and saw some very powerful things, which he writes about. Remember I mentioned this to you, he's got in this, um, he's got a couple of papers that- oh, yes. uh, I've seen in his journals as well. Yes, Good. yes. And he's written a couple of papers on that. Happy New Year, everyone. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. It's been a real labor of love. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make it a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Another thing you can do is donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. 
To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. So thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. You know, his idea of humans as more of a blank, as not a blank slate, but as having an innate human nature, he said, was influenced by that visit. Mm -hmm. He actually went into it more into a sociological perspective on things and came out of it saying, you know what, we are all kind of similar deep down. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had that whole thing of, you know, human beings are, you know, share these kind of similarities. But I think we have to understand when he went there, it was during a period when indigenous people were not highly respected. Uh, they were kind of seen as a curiosity and so forth. And, and Abe had to kind of work under that yeah. general uh, zeitgeist uh, that was going on at the time. So it was very good that he went there, actually. There were not many people. Now, contrast that with Erickson, who also went to the Yurok people and to Pine Ridge, Lakota people. But Erickson, remember, in childhood and society, wrote about it. And that was the difference between Abe and, and, and Erickson. Abe never wrote about it in a central way, but he carried that with him. But what I'm saying is like Abe also as a person, and, and this is very important, who are we as people? Abe was an intellectual. He was a man of the mind. He was not physical in any way. I'm a kind of a physical guy. I love athletics. I love to run, you know. I'm yeah. sort of, Abe was just the opposite. Yeah. He was, a, he was a book person. His body, he didn't know his body. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And when you're working with indigenous people, the body is very important. So Abe had the disadvantage of living in a time when indigenous people were thought of as primitive. Abe had the disadvantage in not living in a land based environment where the elements are, well, yeah, there you are in New York, right? And he had the disadvantage of being a mind person, living in his mind. In spite of that, he saw things. Yeah. In spite of that, you see? He was yeah. very perceptive. And it sounded like he was a friend of yours. I mean, he was very encouraging. He was, of a, he was a yeah. dear friend yeah. who was very generous. I'll mention this, though. And, and again, I want people to know I had a lot of respect for him and I loved him. And so when I say things that sound critical, it's yeah. not to put him down. It's to give some reality base. Abe was very much a guy who said the world was good guys and bad guys. And the good guys were the ones that were more humanistically. And he saw the people who were narrow minded and who were talking about humans as machines as the bad guys. And he was willing to fight them. Yeah, like Skinner? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was willing to fight them. And I can say this. When he was there at Brandeis, he got me, I think, three or four job offers just by picking up the phone. Hey, you should hire this guy. That was the influence he had. Very generous. But also, he was a guy that was a fighter. <laughs> and if you didn't agree with him, he would fight you. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a story that I could tell. He, you see, Abe believed in the goodness of human nature. And I write about this in the book. He said, bring together good-minded, well-minded, you know, like-minded people who wanted to work together and whatever their disciplinary background was, you could come up with something beautiful. So you had a behaviorist, you had an animal psychologist, you had a humanistic psychologist, a cognitive, bring them together and we'll have this beautiful department. You know what happened? What? He brought them together. Yes, and you know, you were there. And, and they took over the department. They did, yes. And this is how I met you, through Jim Fadiman, yeah. you know, who was there as well and said that yeah. you and Jim were kind of the troublemakers of the department. The troublemakers, <laughs> yeah. Abe, see, we were there, we overlapped. Abe and I overlapped a year. And then when Abe left, Jim took over Abe's position, you see. Yes, and yes. So Jim well, and he was I, in California, yes. Yeah. So the thing is that Abe's idea of good people, even though they come from different backgrounds, didn't work. Because what happened was the behaviorists and the uh, people, they were the ones that came to the meetings and took over the department and forced out the humanistic element. So there was some kind of disappointing 
experiences for Abe, you know, when he met the reality. But his connection with indigenous people, I think, is a fascinating part of, of his work. And you see, like, for example, Abe was, you could say, was imbalanced, the mind. Mm-hmm. And one of the teachings that I talk about in the book is the importance of the circle and the medicine wheel in which all parts, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, have to be balanced. Mm. And that was something that Abe was not really aware of because he was an intellectual. He was aware of that in theory. In theory and in practice. Like I say, you know, I love him dearly, but like I say, he didn't connect to his body. That was not part of the deal. The deal was in his mind and his philosophy and his his reaching out. And for example, you know that uh, you know that as well. He really wanted to talk to Aristotle and Plato. I know, and Spinoza, it's, and Spinoza. What a, what a beautiful idea! Yeah, but see, that's skipping over Black Elk and Lame Deer. You know, all those other people, oh, yes, the cultures. He would have had a wonderful time if he could have relaxed. You see, and been with them. That's what I was doing. You know, Scott, I spent hours and days and months in different cultural settings, having very little idea what people were saying because they were speaking a language, just patiently waiting and waiting and waiting. And the experiences of indigenous teachings are hardly ever verbal. Yes. No, I know. And I, I think that that comes through a lot in your book about how the modern day psychology has an oppression of this verbal sort of experimental paradigm. And you make that very clear in your book. I don't mean to, and we're going to get to that in this podcast. I want to kind of close the chapter on this Maslow thread because I think it is so important. And and you're one of the very rare individuals on this planet who can still speak to this. So I hope you don't mind if I belabor it just a little bit more. Um, I want to give some credit here to Ryan Heavyhead and Narquise Blood. Heavy Hand and Narquise Blood who have done this analysis of Blackfoot culture and point out the difference between their conception of actualization and Maslow's notion of self-actualization, which in my reading was not taken, it was adapted from his advisor, Kurt Goldstein, or his mentor, Mm -hmm. Kurt Mm -hmm. Goldstein. He adopted it, and Kurt Goldstein had the phrase self-actualization, which was about his patients, brain trauma, and the amazing ability for people with brain trauma to reorganize and still have capacities. But I thought you could talk a little about what is the Blackfoot culture's notion of actualization? How does it differ? Yeah. Uh, this is a very important, and I was just looking over my book. You know, you have this experience, hey, Scott, once you write a book, it's almost like you forget what you wrote. It's out there. So I had to kind of go back this uh, morning and read, what did I write about this? <laughs> and uh, the thing is that those two guys that you mentioned, I'm glad you did, Ryan Heavyhead and Narcisse Oh, Blood. so it is Head. It is yeah, Head then. It is head. Yeah. Okay. What they're trying to do is to sort of say, yeah, Maslow's great, but he didn't quite get it right. And what they're trying to say is that their notion of self-actualization from a Blackfoot point of view, it's self-actualization in community. The, the whole, like, for example, you go up on a vision quest. You're going up on the vision quest as an individual. You come back and tell your story, but the story is then interpreted. How do you fit into your community and how can you serve your community? You see, so self-actualization is serving the community in the way that's best. Right? And what Abe, I think, was doing was self-actualization was a little more individualistic. So I think that's one of the ways in which they were feeling that his notion of self-actualization had to be sort of more community based. Another thing I think that they point out and I think was different is that and certainly in his early work, Abe had this notion, you know, so that, that 1%, you know, yes, that gets the there. growing tip. The growing tip, exactly. Yes. And from an indigenous point of view, the teaching is that each of us is open to the spark of the creator. Each of us. There's not like a, a kind of a winnowing out and a kind of a, as you say, that's a nice way in some, the growing tip. I like that. Did he ever talk about that? Yes. Yes. He used that phrase. Beautiful. I'm glad you brought yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Because that changes from being elite to being explorers. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But from an indigenous point of view, we all are part of that transcendence. And when you go into a sweat lodge, for example, 
everybody is open to the creator, to the spirits that come in. So I think that's the second part that, and then a third thing is, and I'm not sure how much Abe understood this about hierarchy, okay? Because you remember he did work with uh, Harlow on dominance. Oh, yes. And I just want to mention one thing about Abe that's very important. Abe saw himself always as a research experimental guy. Data. He was data driven. And a lot of people think he was just coming up with these things, you know, through his own musings. No, he was committed to research. Yeah. And people don't appreciate, they, they may disagree with the way he did research, but they don't give him enough credit for being very committed to an empirical approach. And he got that, I think, from, uh, from his work with, uh, with Harlow, you know, yeah. and um, his work with, uh, with the dominance. So I think that, um, you know, he's a very kind of complicated, a very complicated guy. And he was a trailblazer. I think I mentioned to you, hey, Scott, that when he was elected uh, president of the APA, which is a great honor, what he said to me was he was nervous. You know why he was nervous? He was nervous because they, he was not sure they would consider him a psychologist. Yes. Do you know what I was told? He was that dismissive. Yes. And he was very insecure. And I was told by Michael Murphy of Esalen Institute, he told me that, that Abe told him that when he was elected president, the prior president came up to him and said, congratulations on being the first philosopher elected president of That's APA. Right. That must right. have hurt. That must have stung. It hurt him. You see, like I say, you, you have to be nervous when you give your presidential address. He was very, like, as I say, deeply anxious, not just nervous about giving a talk, but existentially. Because, you know, you spend your whole life trying to be a psychologist and change the field and so forth. And then to stand up in front of all these psychologists, fearing that they will think you're basically a fraud. That's what he felt. And that was very troubling. And you know something? Some people did think he was a fraud. Yeah. And calling him a philosopher was a kind way of saying. Some of them thought he was just a, a BSer. Seriously, but just had, coming up with a things. lot of really great. Yeah, but he had a lot of great insights that hold up today. I've been, I have a paper coming out tomorrow, actually, uh, in Journal of Humanistic Psychology, where I test the characteristics of self-actualizing people, and I found ten of his characteristics um, really hold up quite well. Can be measured reliably yeah. and and Absolutely. validly. So you know, he had a lot of. He was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying, Scott? Is yeah. his his commitment to empiricism is always overlooked. Yeah. And the reason is, for example, in his articles, he'll have, let's say, 15 characteristics of self actualization And people say, well, wait a minute. You see, mainstream Western psychology wants to have three, yes. maybe four. 20? No. <laughs> what Abe was saying is these are things that exist, you see. Yes. The whole point of my book is like, let's get away from this notion that mainstream psychology has given us, that we have to have the fewer, the better. We have to have discrete, dichotomous variables. Life is not that way. Yes. And from an indigenous perspective, what they talk about is the flow and the process and how boundaries evaporate. Hey, Scott, yes. there are no boundaries. And the most important thing is the mystery remains. And Abe knew that. Yes. The mystery is a great point you make in your book. And, and Abe really was interested in awe. That's and right. the mysterious uh, towards the, the mysterious. end of his life. It, it really does seem like he came full circle there at the end. Yep. You know, this might be considered one of the definitive podcasts in kind of tackling this controversy. So I wanted to just really get the core of this. Some people think that it's possible that he maybe stole from the Blackfoot Reserve. My own personal opinion, and then I would like to get your opinion because I've really thought of this through very carefully and read all of his work, is that he's not the type of person who would steal or take credit. He was very generous in giving out his many mentors that he had and crediting them, you know, like, such as Ruth Benedict and Harry Harlow, as you say, and Alfred Adler, etc. He was very generous in giving credit. And that in my reading is that, you know, if anything, he's at fault is not maybe mentioning that visit more or bringing in more indigenous psychology into his work, especially when he was coming up with his self-transcendence. But my reading is that it's probably unfair. I would say strongly it is unfair to say that his whole theory 
was somehow stolen from that population because I can see the seeds of many aspects of this theory from his other mentors. So that's my own reading, and I'd love to hear what you think. I think you're right on, Scott. Let me let me see if I can. You're, you're providing because Maslow is dead, and he can't speak to this. Yeah, yeah. So I think we should be as honest and as sensitive yeah. as possible. In yeah. in if people, you know, I would hate you know to die someday and someone say I stole something, you know, that I didn't do. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah. Let me just see if I can. Because this is really important, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. If you talk to the people out there, my impression is, hey, let's get rid of that guy who stole our ideas. No, no. My impression is, how come he didn't acknowledge more what he learned, and he didn't get the full story? That's totally different than yes. stealing. That's a he different thing. Not steal the ideas. If he stole the ideas, no. The ideas came actually from other people, yes. whether Goldstein or, you know, or the Gestalt. No, I, I totally agree. With, and Abe, you know, that's not who he was. He was right. not someone who tried to rip people off. And you know something? He had been ripped off himself enough. Yeah, especially as a child. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I think what it was, was so much, the, again, the historical period I think Abe, and, and I didn't talk to Abe about this, but I knew him well. I think what he must have felt was that talking about that as a source of knowledge was really, at that time, so far from people's understanding that he felt it might lessen the impact of what he was talking about. You understand? Yes. And so he held it in reserve, but no, I don't think he stole that. And he wasn't, you know, he may have been naive. He may have been arrogant, right? Yeah. Say that he was, yeah. but he was not a guy that steals people's ideas. No. That's my impression, and it's great to get confirmation from someone who yeah. actually intersected his yeah. existence with Maslow's existence. Yeah. But yeah. you see, yeah. from a from an indigenous point of view, yes, we have to be very clear. Some people there will feel that that it was stolen, and that's that's a, a very I have to honor that. Yes. That's a feeling that they have, and it has to be honored. I'm just talking about Abe. Yes. You see? Yes. And, well, I'm also interested in the truth, you know, and I think, yeah. that's that's a hard one. (laughs) No, not not that it doesn't exist, but you see, we have to acknowledge that there could be multiple points of view. And I'm not doing a whole Trump thing, you know, but from the point of view of some of the people who were living there, or maybe whose relatives or you know, grandparents talk to Abe, they might have a different view. But I'm talking about, I'm going from Abe into the Blackfoot territory, not from the Blackfoot territory towards Abe. Yes, yes. You understand? So it's very clear that other people might differ. And I think if you read the material from Heavy Head and so forth, I don't think it's an angry reading, huh? No. yeah. I don't, I don't, there's just other aspects. I saw a Twitter exchange that I, that I sent you where it seemed angry. And um, oh, yeah. I, I think that was unfortunate. I can very, sim- very much sympathize with the point that he could have brought, but the same point could be made to anyone, any living psychologist today, right? It's not, right? I mean, to point the finger at Abe seems unfair considering you could point it at a whole field of psychology. I mean, it's not like anyone else, any of the other mainstream psychologists of the time were bringing in that. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Absolutely. And there are some people who've documented the incredible amount of influence indigenous thinking has had on psychology that has been unacknowledged. So let's talk about that for the rest of this podcast. I, I think, mean, uh, yes. I mean, like there are teachings that occur in terms of whether it be balance, questions of balance, uh, questions of spirituality. A lot of people don't acknowledge their sources. A lot of people. And you're right about Abe. He was careful. Like, take, for example, the notion of synergy. Well, I've written about synergy, and the book talks about synergy. Abe was very careful to talk about Ruth Benedict. Yes, yes. And I'm very careful to talk about Ruth Benedict and Abe. And, of course, Buckminster Fuller, who started the whole thing. And who knows before Buckminster Fuller? You know, no, no ideas are our own. Yes. And any psychologist, you see... Like positive psychology. What do you think of positive psychology? Well, I noticed that you didn't mention positive psychology at all in your book. I mentioned it, but in a fairly negative way. No, I did mention it. I I must have missed it. Uh, 
that what positive psychology has done, Scott, is to ignore Abe and so, his work. I couldn't agree with that more, but I wouldn't say positive psychology has ignored Abe. I would say Martin Seligman, who is the founder of the field, has dismissed Abe you know, the founding of the field. But I know a lot of positive psychologists who may be in part due to the fact I can't stop talking about Abe to them, <laughs> <laughs> has acknowledged in their work a huge debt. I'll give a specific example. Ken Sheldon has Ooh. done really good work on trying to test some humanistic theories from Carl Rogers and others and has said how he's deeply influenced by Maslow, self-determination theory, mm -hmm. individuals, DC and Ryan talk about their debt to the humanistic theories. But I do share your frustration for certain aspects, uh, certain, yeah. particularly the founding yeah. of the field and how it was founded as in a way that was pitted against a humanistic psychology or just dismissive of, oh, that was just the spiritual, you know, like non-scientific field. Yeah. Yeah. I do you share that frustration. Nowadays, it, with narrative uh, research and narrative psychology, yes. it is right smack in the middle of that whole Again, empirical yeah. wave. And to think of, to dismiss Abe as non-scientific, that's the worst because that's what he faced when he was yeah. practicing. You're not a scientist. So to, to bring that up again, that's not right. But the whole notion, for example, from an indigenous point of view and talking again about the book, one of the teachings is that we don't own knowledge. We share it. Yes. And one of the teachings is, unless you share knowledge, it dies. You see? So none of it's original. <laughs> yes. Scott, what could be original? It's already been said. We repackage, we restate, we try to bring more relevance. Eh? But yeah. we don't create, we don't invent ideas. And from an indigenous point of view, we don't invent them because part of the task is to listen to the teachings that have come over the generations. The good elder will say, I'm only telling you what I was told. They won't say to you, I'm telling you what I discovered. Mm. You understand? Now, when they say, I'm only telling you what I was told, they have proven it in their own lives. Like an elder will say to you, and this is what I mentioned in the book, here's a story. If it makes sense to you, good. If it doesn't, don't take it. Test it out, you see? But it's not original knowledge. It's a story. Where does the story come from? The old people. You see, the old people. There is nothing new. Like when indigenous people talk, did the sun ever rise in the West? No. So when you say, look at the sun rising. Yeah, people have done that for thousands and thousands of years. So Western psychology is very much into kind of like, I've got a new theory. I've got a new thing. And you look at it, it's the same old stuff with a different label. And that's good. You also criticize measurement, in a sense, like the measurement of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that criticism? Well, look at that. That stems back to your Harvard days. And, yeah, look yeah. at it this way. I was with, I'll tell you a story about, how, you know, Howard Gardner? I do, yes. Yeah, seven intelligence. Okay, so Howard comes up to me before he really hit it big. You know, I've got this theory of intelligences. What do you think of it? So he showed me his draft. Oh, looks good. I said, but what about, I think you've left something out, I think is how I said it. What do you mean? What about spiritual intelligence? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the, no, no, I can't do that because we can't measure it. And what I said to him is, the fact that you can't measure it doesn't mean you don't mention it. But the preoccupation, like Carol Gilligan, she was another colleague of mine. Wonderful. I love her, right? And a wonderful person. Yes. Her theory took off when she developed some scales to measure the attitudes and the perceptions that she was studying right. and telling in stories. When she had a scale, it took off all of a sudden. So mainstream Western psychology, basically, you know, if you can't measure, it doesn't exist. And the thing that's really most perverse is... If we can't measure it, it's only because we haven't developed the measures that are sophisticated enough, and eventually we will. Right. So the notion of the mystery remains, which is a, a key part of the indigenous approach for the mainstream Western psychologists primarily, not all, but primarily, is the mystery remains because we're not yet there with a sophisticated method to find out what it is.
Yes, that point is very well taken, but you do admit that measurement is the cornerstone of the scientific method. I mean, it's... it's, exactly it's what you say by measurement, eh, Scott? You see? Like, for example, if I tell you a story, a life story or a story of, to, from an indigenous point of view, that's ultimate data. It doesn't need to be analyzed. It doesn't need to be questioned. It's data. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's how science and psychology should proceed, but it has to be respected. That's one form. See, I see multiple forms of research and science. Yeah, I know. I see what you're saying, but there's certainly a tension there between that sort of narrative approach and, you know, measurement needs to be generalizable, replicable, right? It has to uh, have validity. Yeah. And you're saying those criteria do not apply to the indigenous population and their... Certain aspects of it. Okay. Certain aspects. I think it would be a mistake to say from an indigenous point of view, all we care about is stories. But what I'm trying to say is that okay. different modes of scientific work and scientific process, one of which is stories that tell the, the truth about a person's life. And there's another part of doing science, which is an experimental paradigm control groups, experimental groups, and so forth. And why not have multiple paths towards, truth. as you mentioned before, the truth? Yeah, is, and you were going to say but, that, yeah. yeah. But respecting that there are multiple paths, and from an indigenous point of view, one of the paths that people really value is the story that one tells, you see. Yeah, I could see a skeptic saying that one can recognize the value of it without calling it science. Like science is a very specific meaning. How would you yeah. respond to someone saying, I mean, well, you see, but Scott, this is, I mean, this is a great interview. Where are you? <laughs> Where have you been all these years? <laughs> but you see, that's exactly the point. The word science has been co opted to refer to a particular set of, you know, a particular methodology and a particular yes. set of, and it's a power word. Huh? Validity, objectivity reliability, these are power words. And what I'm saying is that if we keep science in that more narrowly, I would call it Western, you know, positivistic paradigm, we are taking all those power words. And when we think of other ways of knowing, huh? other ways of knowing, and one of the chapters in the book that's on the research is called ways of knowing. And when I think of ways of knowing, then I don't think of science, I think of ways of knowing, one of which is the Western scientific method, another is the narrative storytelling method, another is the purely experiential method in which you don't even, you can't even say what happened, you see? Ways of knowing. And do you put them all within the rubric of, of the scientific method? Absolutely, absolutely. Scott, that's where you have an understanding of multiple worlds. Remember, we started out, when you were little, what happened? Well, when I was little, I saw that the world I was in was not the only world. Now, here's the hard part, Scott, okay? Do you believe, who's doing the interview, right? <laughs> but do you believe, as some people do, that if we get more and more understanding, eventually we'll see there's only one way? I have to say to you, I'm not sure. Yes. I mean, you say something that really stuck with me. You say there is no one way, only right ways. That's right. And it, I mean, that stuck with me. That phrase maybe is also a guide for how to live your life. <laughs> you know, you like, know let me tell you, you know what empathy means? I'm not good. See, I've lived a lot of years and I still. You look so young still. It's amazing. <laughs> you Listen, met, he I, met Maslow and Eric Erickson and you look like you're ready to go party. <laughs> I am. No, party. I'm ready to go running. Running. Got, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen, Scott. The thing is that if you are willing to see the validity, you see, the other thing is I respect what others are doing. Like, for example, guys like Richie Davidson, you know. Yes. He's like right into that heavy duty scientific method, you know. Great, because he's doing it with some sensitivity, you know. So why not different? And let me tell you something else, okay? So Danny Muscular, the guy I work with, I write about this in the book. When he was growing up, his grandma said to him, sit on this stump here and observe the gophers. We have gophers up here, you know, little things, you know, and they're gopher colonies. And he would spend hours observing the key to any scientific method, observation. 
See, so there are ways in which there are shared processes. I'm going to have to push back against that a second and see what you think about this because right. can't obser- individual observations be wrong? Like, so, you know, let's say, give me a specific example. Like, there are people that say they experience God um, or that, that experience certain aspects of the universe that physicists then say, well, we've tested that and there's no evidence that that's true. <laughs> Are you saying you would put both on the same level of certainty of probability of truth? The no, I'd like, to have, I'd like to have them both in the room together and we'll all connect. Hey, different ways of knowing, different ways of knowing. I'm, mm-hmm. not, into, I'm not into giving, hey, I guess I would say, Scott, I'm not into a hierarchy of value. It's like pain. You know, some people say, hey, how could that person feel pain? They've got all the money in the world they need. They've got, you know, a great job. You know something? Pain hurts. Scott, you lose a child. You're a millionaire. You don't think it hurts? You see? So I'm not into kind of saying one is better than the other. Bring them in the room together, you see? Bring them in the room together. And that just enriches things. The notion of synergy I talk about is multiple ways of looking at things coming together in unexpected ways to create a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. That's beautiful. It is beautiful. And you know, the other thing, Scott, is you see the whole context of what we're talking about has to be seen within an historical power structure. At this point in time, eh, Scott, indigenous people are being overturned, overrun, overpowered. And like even, for example, in the whole genome thing, the genetic material is being robbed, and they call it biopiracy, for the drug companies. Oh, I thought you were going to mention the Democrat, Elizabeth Warren. Oh, I don't want to get into that, yeah, yeah. It's a whole ridiculous thing. Yeah. But you see, what's happening is they want, to get iso- they want to get genetic material that has not been contaminated. Yeah. What does that mean? Isolated. What does that mean? Indigenous. You see? So the whole political context and the scientific IQ testing, hey, Scott, indigenous people systematically score lower, getting back to the IQ. Why? The IQ test is totally culturally biased and getting back to the Howard Gardner thing. We don't measure spirituality because we don't talk about it because we can't measure it with the measurements that are in Western psychology, you see. But if you don't use those, why not talk about spirituality? It's, um, what would I say? I would say to that, that the test itself is not biased, but, well, the, it, in one sense it is, and in one sense it isn't. You're abs- I'm with you in the sense that yeah. it is culturally, like, we are the ones that decided what kind of content, yeah. what kind of vocabulary mm-hmm. items, what kind of, uh, you know, even like the Ravens matrices, Jim Flynn has shown, it does have a cultural bias in the sense, like, if you never grew up looking at these kind of abstract pictures, you're not going to know what to do with them as much as if you have a scientific literate culture. So I think in that sense, you're absolutely correct. But it doesn't mean that that test is meaningless or not measuring some set of skills that are important. Yeah, Yeah, that's what I would say. One of the skills it measures is abstract uh, reasoning. Doing well, yeah, doing well at university and certain, like you say, spatial abstract things. Like when I went to the Kalahari, you know, I'm a psychologist. I wanted to do a uh, show some pictures, you know, because Murray was one of my mentors and he mm. came up with TAT. So I had some pictures that Not I Charles Murray, let's be clear. No, no, Henry Murray. Henry Murray. A lot of people might not know who Henry Murray is. He was a yeah, legend. Harry Murray, TAT. Harry, came. yeah. Yeah. So I had these pictures, hey, Scott, and showed them. What's the first thing they did? First thing they did was to turn the picture around to see what was in the back, to see the backside of the image. So the whole notion of a picture was not in their world experience it was if it was a picture of a face there's got to be a back to the to the face right. you understand yeah. so in a very in a very kind of powerful way giving a paper and pencil test itself like i'll give you an example okay from an indigenous point of view the way people are taught often is if you know the answer to something you don't ask a person a question or if the person knows the answer. Like, I wouldn't ask you, hey, Scott, well, what is two plus two? That's an insult. Right. right. Now, from an indigenous point of view, if you find that someone asks you obvious questions or questions okay. with obvious answers, what happens? You become suspicious. Yeah. 
So they interviewed people who took the IQ test and, you know, it starts out very easy. And some of the kids, because the questions were so easy, turn off and become suspicious. Yeah. What's this guy trying to do? Trick me up. Yeah. I know the, we all know the answer to that one. That's how I it, felt on the SATs. That's why I did so bad on my SAT. Yeah? <laughs> we're going to go, we're going to go with that reason. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, this is great. We're having a conversation, hey? Eh? Oh, for sure. So, so you're also a psychologist by training, right? Uh huh. That's right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I you went know, to I, Yale though, not Harvard. Yeah, I went to Yale too. Oh, you did? Under, undergraduate. You know, I had the best compliment for this book I wrote. You know what the best compliment was? There was a psychologist. I've done some work just recently with a thing called RPC, where we have people who have mental problems but are incarcerated, right? Yeah. And one of the psychologists over there read the book, and you know what he said? He said, I love the book, and particularly the fact that as a psychologist, I felt respected. Yeah. That was, to me, that was a wonderful compliment because you see, when you're writing a book like this for a minute, it's so easy to make the bad guys. All psychologists are, you know, they don't know what they're doing, they're, they're worthless, you know, so forth. And I was trying because one of the teachings I got in the book was respect. Yeah. And that means respect for always. Eh? And as you said, all ways are good, not one way. That means we have to respect multiple ways of going about it. You see, and what you're doing is beautiful because you're pushing back, but you're also joining. Oh, for sure. Which is, which is how we have to do, you know, we don't have to agree, but we have to respect. Yeah. I really like that a lot. You know, yeah. just to wrap up here a second, you know, you talk about what psychologists, you know, the way I visit, there's actually a very hopeful message here, right? You're actually saying that there's so much untapped potential among mainstream psychologists that we could do so much more to increase interconnection, honoring the interconnections that define us, renewing synergies of multiple psychologies. Multiple psychologies. Right, things of that nature. You're saying that you're not saying like it's not just a critique of horrible, bad psychologists, but it's the way I, the way I read it is you're saying there's so much more the field could be. So much more. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you one little story, and because I think that's a, such an important point. So I was teaching some clinical psychology doctoral students, and we had an elder come in, Mary Lee, wonderful woman, and I write about that in the book. And she talks about her traditional counseling, and what she does is she emphasizes listening. She says the kids I work with, they want to have their story heard. So one of my students, after she left, one of my clinical psychology students said, "Isn't this kind of like Rogers?" I mean, what's the difference? And, and I said, yeah, it's like Rogers, but there's a big difference. Rogers said, listening is one of the components of effective counseling. Mary Lee said, listening is counseling. Now, now, hey, listen, Scott, you've been trained, let's say, for five years. I don't know what your orientation was, but the students I work with, a lot of it, usually CBT or, or dialectical, you know, whatever. Big investment in that. And then to be told that the essence of counseling is listening. This is very hard and a little bit threat. So I said to him, no, no, don't misunderstand. The essence is listening, but still bring your skill set. Right. That's the enhancement, right? Bring your CBT training, bring your analytic training, but don't forget the foundation upon which your all your whole work is listening. And that's an indigenous perspective. Indigenous perspective is never give up what you know. It's to add to it. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Add Let me share. One more thing, which is I want people to know that in this book that the royalties, author royalties are going back to the people. Okay. So it's a way of encouraging. I'm trying to encourage people to get to the book because not only I think it's important teachings, but it can help to raise a little money because when I give back, let's say, Five six hundred dollars to an elder who's living in the Kalahari. You have no idea how much that means. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible infusion that can help with basic survival kind of tasks. So I just what, want to. Mention. What if people want to help even more? Like, let's say I want to donate. I have this urge after listening to your you talk about your life's work, and I want to donate more money to that. Are there certain websites I can go to? Like, what can yeah. I do? The one thing I would mention, hey, Scott, because there's a lot of options, but the one I like is the Kalahari People's Fund. Okay, I'll put a link Kalahari, to all this in the show notes. Yeah, Kalahari People's Fund. Okay. And it started in the 70s 
focusing mainly on the Chantoisi, but its basic community development projects, like, for example, protection of land resources. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, Kalahari People's Fund. Okay. And from there, eh, Scott, one could go in many different directions. Yes, if you could send me a link to that, I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Dick, I just want to say thank Can I call you Dick? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, usually I just thank my guests, you know, thank you for being on the show, but I feel like for you, just thank you for like your your existence, you know, on, you know, 50 years and showing and shining a spotlight on a very under, uh, well, what would you say? They're under what population? Under, underappreciated. Underappreciated, They're yeah. Under, under, yeah. Misunderstood, underappreciated, yeah. underrespected. And uh, yeah. So listen, I'll tell you too. It's a real pleasure on this. This is fantastic. And I wish, can I get a podcast of this too? How do I do that? I want to, I oh, want to hear. Absolutely. When I publish this, I'll send no, you the link. Conversation we're having is great. Yeah. It's no, really I will absolutely send you the link when it's out. Okay. Thanks again, okay. Dick. Okay. Take good care. You too. Okay. Yeah. See you. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of The Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.